testing, one, two, three. The clerk has informed me that we do have a quorum. Welcome to the fall 2017 town meeting. We will get going. Um, and we will start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I'd like to invite Girl Scout troops representing the 6th, 8th, and 10th grade, Caroline Cole, Samantha Riley, Lucy Seckler, Sonali Goal, and Trina Garrity, to please recite, lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I'm going to ask you to come closer to the mic so that we can hear you. of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First up this evening is um, Clerk Dottie Powers, and I'll, Dottie, I'll read the fall meeting rules after your presentation. So we did want to explain to everybody, and if you would get seated, please, um, we wanted to, the, the moderator and the clerk in the town are presenting a pilot on electronic voting today. I'm just going to ask folks to please sit down. Okay. Um, so Dottie is going to, Dottie Powers, our town clerk, is going to explain the um, electronic voting pilot, how it works, and answer any questions that, um, that anyone might have at this time. Clerk Powers. Good evening. I'm Dottie Powers, town clerk. We're doing a pilot tonight regarding electronic voting and its future at Westwood Town Meetings. The main goal of utilizing electronic voting is to engage voters and obtain votes, go, vote counts quickly so that town meeting may proceed more expediently. The polling software we'll be using is in integrated with PowerPoint using radio frequency and is extremely secure and cannot be hacked or as accessed by the internet. I want to begin by thanking Greg Alexander from Turning Technologies for allowing us to do this demonstration at no cost to the town. The Bylaw Review Committee and I have been working with Turning Technology and other vendors for several years. We are piloting electronic voting tonight after several towns throughout the Commonwealth have Im implemented or are testing the use of electronic voting at their town meetings. With the many types of technology available today, we want to ensure our voters that we put the best program forward for our town meeting. Moving to electronic voting systems would constitute a significant change to town meeting procedures. Therefore, before implementation, it will be important to get feedback from town meeting attendees. There will be a slide at the end of the night for you to vote on whether you think the town should move forward with this and also a questionnaire which was given upon check-in. If town meeting does decide that it's prudent to go forward, we will work with town council to amend the bylaws to give the moderator the discretion of allowing electronic voting in place of a standing count. Thank you to our moderator, Alice Moore, for allowing this pilot to go forward tonight, as well as Christine McCarthy, who has worked diligently with the vendor and assisted in putting this together. So each registered voter has received a response card keypad upon check-in. Everybody should have one of these. When the moderator doubts a voice vote, the response card will be used in place of a standing vote. For each vote, you will press the button with a number that corresponds with the vote you wish to cast. 1A is yes, 2B is no. 
If you press the wrong button, that's okay. The last button you press before voting is closed will be the vote that will register. You will have 20 seconds to cast your vote. Your response card is programmed for a single event use, this town meeting only. These devices use a reliable radio frequency and are secure. If you have to leave for your seat for any reason tonight, you will need to deposit your response card and then recheck it, recheck in upon your return. When the meeting does adjourn, all response cards must be given to staff who will be at exits to collect them. So let's start here. Let's, let's see if we have a quorum. Everybody please vote yes. Press one, a yes. You will have 20 seconds to cast your vote. Are you opening the vote, Dottie? Yes. Starting now. So to vote yes, you will hit the green circle. No, vote, vote yes is one. A. No. We're all it's voting two. yes on this question. Can everybody find the, the one yes? Question? Can we, can we have microphones to the? It should be, it, it should, you, your vote should be up there in green. And then at the end, when it's red, it goes away. So, so it would say either one or A? It should show one or A after I press the one button. Because I see 41, I see the battery power, and I see Right, but once I press it, how do I, how do I know I pressed it hard enough? We're gonna, I'm, I'm gonna, gonna let, recognize. I'm, gonna let, I'm actually gonna let Greg answer this. Okay, I'm gonna let Greg answer that. Greg Alexander, who is a visitor this evening, but who is assisting in implementing the pilot. And just so folks know, this is a pilot, and we, uh, you were distributed a questionnaire. We want to see at the end of this, how this works, whether you like it, whether you don't like it, and also what suggestions you might have for implementation. Okay. When, when you press the button with your vote, you'll see the light on the right-hand side, uh, right above the 3C. It, it may blink kind of an amber color, but it should turn green. And then on the LCD screen, you'll see either 1 slash A or 2 slash B. It will remain for just a, a second or two, and then it will go back, the device will go back to sleep. It, if, it, if, you, if it's showing you the little circle with the line through it, hit that button again. So I keep pressing it. I see the circle with the line through it, but I can't get it to acknowledge the 1A vote. Oh, it just went. It did go. Okay, so that's the first time. So people are still coming in. And for those of you who are just coming in, we are um, demonstrating an electronic voting pilot. And so this is the instruction phase where we will work out all the kinks.
So if, is, if everybody can see, the responses are coming in. So I will need the folks who are holding microphones to look for people who do have questions and want to be recognized. Um, we will we'll end this question and we will ask it again so that folks have another opportunity to test it. There is someone, David, in the back who is standing with her hand raised. Can we get a microphone there, please, quickly? Um, Jennifer Kneer, one, uh, 237 Alder Road. If I push the channel button down on the bottom left and then hit the one, it recorded my vote, but it didn't do that before I pushed the channel button. So uh, again, folks, this is a test tonight. We're testing this. Thank you all for your patience while we work out this little kink in the system. Oh. Okay, we're going to we're going to go to the next question. What a no vote looks like? Please, everybody, press 2B on your response card for no. So we still appear to be having problems with the system. While well, that's being worked out, I am going to read the rules of town meeting. So I am Alice Moore, your town moderator. Um, this is my fourth term, and I am grateful and honored to serve the town of Westwood. I reside at 44 Whitney Avenue, and um, we do have a quorum present, and so we will move forward with the town's business. The first order of business will be the reading of the town warrant, which was duly posted by the constables of the town. There is a motion from the selectmen to dispense with the reading of the warrant. The, d the selectmen have moved to dispense with the reading of the articles in the full warrant. All in favor of that motion, please signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. And it is a vote in favor of dispensing with the reading of the warrant. I take a moment to outline the procedure for town meeting this evening. Persons who are not registered voters in Westwood cannot vote and must sit in the visitors section, which has been clearly marked. And this evening is in the back um, corner of the um, auditorium. The only exception is for town employees or consultants or attorneys who may sit with their appropriate board or commission. Only registered voters may vote here in Westwood tonight and only registered and only registered voters may speak. And if you are registered and wish to speak, please stand or come forward to the microphones set up on both sides of the front room. 
and do wait to be recognized by the moderator. For this fall town meeting, we have 16 articles for action. The articles will be considered in order and may only be considered by the town when a proper motion to take up the article has been made and seconded. In our meetings and pursuant to our charter, the Finance and Warrant Commission, which I may refer to as the Finance Commission or the FinCom going forward, makes the initial recommendation on a motion for each article. And those motions and explanations of the vote appear in the warrant booklet, which were mailed or which um, are available on your iPad or tablet, or copies of which are in the, um, in the back uh, check-in area. Please ask someone if you do need some help. The Finance Commission's recommendations are in favor of or uh, for indefinite postponement of an article and do appear in bold face after each article with an explanation of the FinCom's deliberations. Amendments may be made except for uh, motion for indefinite postponement. Amendments to other motions may be made by voice request and must be in writing and presented to the moderator. Amendments must be seconded, then open for discussion, and then voted on. If successful, we then consider the effect on the main motion. The moderator is responsible to track motions and make rulings about whether a motion is in scope and properly presented. Once a motion has been made, we may then discuss the merits of the article. We will continue discussion reasonably and respectfully until everyone who has an interest in speaking has had an opportunity. It is the moderator's job to maintain order and decorum and facilitate an effective town meeting with the successful conclusion of the town's business. Rules of speaking. Under our town bylaws, any person who wishes to address the town meeting shall stand and wait to be recognized by the moderator. The speaker shall confine themselves to the question under consideration. If I miss anyone who strongly desires to speak and has something new to say, please go to the microphone and I will recognize you. Everyone who wants to speak will have that opportunity. Microphones, again, are located at the front podium on either side, and mobile microphones are with folks at the sides. When addressing the meeting, you must state your name and address, which is required for the record of this proceeding. I ask that you state your point and allow for comment. I will limit repetitive comments. If you hear my gavel, you must stop speaking. I will announce what type of vote is required by the voters, majority or special vote of two-thirds or four-fifths or more in circum certain circumstances. Please note that a motion to reconsider may only be voted on the same night the article was voted. Reconsideration requires a two-thirds vote of those present in voting. This means that if there is a second night of this town meeting, warrant articles already voted on may not be reconsidered. Before each vote, I will explain the vote, what vote is required. I will then ask for the yeas and the nays. Where the decision is clear, I will call the vote. If I think there is any doubt, I will ask for a standing vote or, in this case, an electronic vote. One means yes and two means no if we are voting electronically. Once the vote is counted, um, you will see the results and I will announce the results. There is a rule by which seven voters may doubt the vote, and then a vote count will be conducted. These rules are covered in our town bylaws, and now we will turn to the business in warrant, um, unless anyone has any questions at this time. Hearing and seeing no questions. Clerk Powers, are we proceeding with the... You know, I think, electronic voting. I think I, I just discovered also if you hit channel and then press either one, you'll see the number come up. Try that. Okay. Okay. Yeah, um, Greg is gonna has another option for us. There's okay, some kind please of be with, bear with us for another moment. Our technical people feel that there's some kind of an interference happening on this radio frequency. 
that we're using. So we're going to change the channel on the, the device. You'll hit, the, like we've said before, hit the channel button, and then you will hit 7, 4, and then the channel button again. And that will change the channel of the device so that it can communicate with the receiver. So you want everybody to do that now? Yes, if you will. Channel, 7, 4, channel. You should see the light blink green the second time you hit channel. And at that point, now the device is on a different frequency. It's on a different channel within that frequency. And uh, we should be able to eliminate the conflict. OK, everybody want to try again? OK, so, so why don't we start with the question about the quorum? So polling is going to be open now. And I want everybody to press 1, yes. Yes, number one, just one. Don't hit channel, just one, 1A. One All right, you know what, to, ch press channel and then one. That's how I got it the last time, no? Okay, apologies, everybody. And thus you see why we're doing a pilot. Yes. So is everyone getting the same instructions? Channel 74, channel. Channel 74 and channel. Dottie, you need to say that so everyone okay, can hear Okay, so it. now everybody please. Press one. Are the polls open? I guess we're gonna just, okay. Okay, so thank you all for your patience while we tried to work this out, but for some reason there's interference and we're not able to get the appropriate channels. We did test this earlier and it was fine. So again, thank you for your patience. And this is why this is something that can't really, a decision can't be made hastily on this. There's a lot involved. So thank you all for your patience tonight. OK. So counters should be prepared to do standing counts when necessary. And with that, I am going to recognize um, Chairman of the Board of Selectmen, um, John Hickey. Um, to provide an overview from the Board of Selectmen.
Good evening, everyone. John Hickey, 117 Sunrise Road. Uh, thank you all for being here this evening. Uh, I just want to touch briefly on uh, tonight's business. And before we get there, just a few announcements from the town. Uh, we wanted to first ensure that we properly welcome two new people to the, the town's leadership. First, Emily Parks, who is no stranger to the town of Westwood, having served as our high school principal and as a deputy superintendent. And John Deckers, who again is no stranger to the town of Westwood. John grew up in Hingham and is a graduate of Severian Brothers. They both uh, joined the town in their new leadership roles this fall. A couple of, yeah, thank you. A couple of major um, milestones for Westwood also occurred this fall when we opened the new uh, fire station in Islington. The new police headquarters is uh, being operationalized as we speak. And uh, we did a groundbreaking for the Bridge Street water treatment plant so that generations to come will enjoy the clean water that we have. We also wanted to recognize some major occurrences this fall. And first among those is that Westwood High School was one of only seven high schools in the state of Massachusetts to be recognized for high achievement and high progress. Those are specific terms. And high progress, I think, is, is the more um, important of the two. It shows that year over year, our students uh, function at a very high level, but they continue to grow. And that really is a testament to all of us as community providing the resources and the leadership of our school committee the staff, faculty, and administration of our school department. And we should all take that as a point of pride. I also did want to recognize, and I think we've all been there with some technical difficulties in our lives, but our moderator, Alice Moore, our town clerk, Dottie Powers, uh, members of the Charter Review Committee and the Bylaw Committee have spent months if not years studying the use of technology at town meeting. So obviously we have some ways to go, but as we look to the future and we have to figure out how to capitalize on technology to advance this process, we will get there. So I thank them for all of their work. The uh, FinCom, I wanna thank the FinCom who for every town meeting studies and deliberates all of the warrant articles that come before us. It just kind of turned out that tonight there are 16 articles broken down into four very high level categories. And the first is an assessment for the Blue Hills um, Regional School District. We are part of that. Blue Hills is rehabbing all of their buildings. There are two accounting formalities and funding for the advancement of the Gay Street Sidewalk Project. There are four zoning articles, a residential cap on Washington and High Streets districts, accessory uses in the highway district, redefining medical uses and a housekeeping revision. There are four petition articles, um, a warrant article to rescind a 2016 town meeting vote, to designate electronic voting method at town meeting, I think that's gonna be a theme this evening, appropriate funds to purchase such system and establish that citizen petitions be the main motion at town meeting. And lastly, uh, two articles from the town clerk allowing the town the option to open town offices on Saturday and exempting senior citizens over the age of 70 from annual dog licensing fees and two miscellaneous uh, articles, accepting the Thompson Avenue as a public way and grant a small easement to the Ark of South Norfolk on Clapwood Tree Street to construct a sidewalk over some town land. And lastly, I just wanna say thank you for coming out on a cold and rainy night. Without you, the functioning of our town government doesn't happen. And sociologist Robert Putnam wrote that what really matters from the point of view of social capital and civic engagement is not merely nominal membership, but active and involved membership. Your presence here tonight is a testament to your involved membership. Thank you. And with that, we will start with Article 1 to see if the town will vote to approve the $84,862,768 borrowing authorized by the Blue Hills Regional Technical High School District for the purpose of paying costs of renovating, reconstructing, and making extraordinary repairs to the Blue Hills Regional Technical High School located at 800 Randolph Street in Canton, Massachusetts. 
This comes before town meeting on the Finance and Warrant Commission's unanimous vote um, that the town so vote. Is there a second? second. There is a presentation, I understand, on this piece from um, Charlie Flayhive, and I will now recognize Charlie Flayhive, former principal of Westwood High School. Thank you, Charles Lay, I have 21 Glen Road, Westwood, Massachusetts, and proud of it. Uh, nine years ago, um, I guess I volunteered to be on the Blue Hill School Board. Uh, it was only two nights a month for two years. It turned out to be a lot more and uh, very challenging, but um, I, I enjoy it, acting in the uh, best interests of of all the students, but especially my own town. I just give you a, I know you have the booklet, but I give you a few little uh, projects. Back in the early 70s, Westwood signed on with eight other towns to become a regional vocational technical high school. Uh, about five or six years ago, we started to research a renovation project. We applied to the Mass Building Authority uh, it took a few years, there are a number of steps we have to go through, um, but we were approved for the, for the building. And just a few facts, Blue Hills has 857 students from nine towns. Westwood currently has eight. Four of them are seniors. We don't, we don't uh, send a lot of kids there, but it's, very, it's a very important part of the educational offerings that this school offers. Um, our renovation project has been approved for 84.8 million, of which 55.89% will be reimbursed. The project will make the building accessible for all. Many safety improvements will bring us into ADA compliance disabilities, such as a sprinkler system and elevators. The plumbing systems are in disrepair, the electric Electrical system is antiquated, and new energy system doors and windows will be installed. Westwood will spend about $523,000 over 30 years. Now, the way this is put together, we have to get the approval of all nine towns. So far, I think we have about six. There are three of them being presented tonight. We're one. Um, if, for, if per chance one town backs out, we have to have a, um, a vote of all the towns, which would be very expensive, et cetera, but um, my, I think it's going to go very well. The estimated payments, we will not be making a payment on this for, for the year 2020. So in 2019, there are no payments. 2020, Westwood will be assessed for $13,161. Um, to say the least, it's a bargain. It's something that has to be done, um, and I hope that we, we can all support it. I thank the FinCom for listening to our presentation before and supporting this. Um, we do have a little PowerPoint for it, okay? Much of this you've probably seen before. The total cost of the town the initial cost, et cetera, as it works down. We haven't received uh, an interest rate yet, but they're estimating about 3%. You get the, okay, that gives you, that gives you an example of the percentage of towns. You can see Randolph is by far um, the heaviest town with over 300 students and closely followed by Braintree, which is a much, much larger. Holbrook, um, which may drop a bit. They've, they have recently built a new middle, middle and senior high school. Okay. This is the lowest cost option. It, is, it avoids any cost escalation. The longer we wait, the more expensive it becomes. And these repairs are very much needed, especially with our ADA project or whatever. Okay. That, 
I thank you to wrap it up. Um, again, I thank the members of the town for voting for me. Um, I did get appointed to fill a vacancy and then um, so much fun it stayed on for a few more years. This is the ninth year. But, uh, you know, I'm one of those I think we come from a great town. Um, we don't send a lot of kids, but we need this option for there are students that are really, really need this. This is part of our whole school system. One of the reasons why people like all of us, including myself, we live in Westwood. And I thank you. Okay, there is a motion to approve um, Article 1. Is there any discussion on Article 1? Seeing and hearing no discussion. Um, oh, there, is, there is someone. Yes, sir. Please state your name and address. Yes. Uh, good evening. I'm Alan McDonald, uh, 674 Clapboard Tree Street. I used to be on the Westwood School Committee, and I remember coming before you when Westwood High School was having the same issues, uh, an old building that was not in very good shape. Um, if you've spent any time in the lobby out there, you see the most important thing I've ever done for this town was to get this school built. My name is on the plaque. Um, as chairman. <laughs> My name's on there as chairman anyway. Uh, Barb Delisle was the chairman when it was open. Um, but there, there's one thing that is most important as an adult can do, and that is to educate our children. And it's not just our own children, but the children of our town. Uh, Westwood sends only eight kids to Blue Hill. Um, we also used to send kids to Norfolk County Aggie. I'm not sure if they do anymore. But Westwood High School does not provide that type of education. It's, it's a college prep school. So if you want to become a plumber or a carpenter or a computer technician, I think Westwood offers that. Uh, you go to Blue Hills, which offer these courses in spades. Um, it used to be, when I was on the school committee, we had in the 90 percentile of our graduates from Westwood High School going off to college. But it wasn't 100 percent. So there were still students who went to Westwood High School, a college prep school, and not going off to college. Those are children who, if the schools were in better shape, maybe they would have gone to Blue Hill Regional or Norfolk County Aggie. So I really think that this is the most important issue that we can provide is to vote for this. And as an aside, 25 years ago, uh, we put an addition on our house that was done by Blue Hill Regional. Uh, the only issue we've had since then are some bricks in our chimney crumbled, and it was not their fault. They did okay. a really good job. Thank you. Other discussion on Article 1? Okay. Seeing and hearing no discussion, um, this again is a, a majority vote. Um, brought before us on the Finance and Warrant Commission's um, recommendation that the town approve Article 1. Um, all those in favor, please say yes. yes. Opposed, no. It appears to be, and it is, a unanimous vote in favor of Article 1. Article 2, to see if the town will vote to establish under Chapter 40, Section 5B of the Massachusetts General Laws, a new stabilization fund, the Meals Hotel Reserve Fund, for the purpose of reserving dedicated funds from local option meals and hotel tax revenues into the fund for future town meeting appropriation, and dedicate 100% of local option hotel and 100% of local option meals excise tax revenues into the fund. This comes before 
Town meeting on the Finance and Warrant Commission's recommendation that the town so vote and does require a two-thirds vote. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion on Article 2? Seeing and hearing no discussion. And again, a, a requirement two-thirds vote. All those in favor, please say yes. 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 Opposed, no. The yeses have it. It's a unanimous vote in favor of Article 2. Article 3, to see if the town will vote to accept Mass Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 40, Section 13E, to establish a reserve fund known as the Special Education Reserve Fund for the purpose of reserving funds to be used in the upcoming fiscal years to pay without further appropriation for unanticipated or unbudgeted costs of special education out of district tuition or transportation and to accept future Medicaid reimbursement into the fund and to transfer from available funds the sum of $576,000 to the Special Education Reserve Fund. This comes before town meeting on the Finance and Warrant Commission's recommendation that the town so vote and requires a majority vote. Is there a second? Second. Is there discussion on Article 3? Seeing and hearing no discussion, all those in favor of Article 3, please say yes. 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 Opposed, no. It is a unanimous vote in favor of Article 3. Article 4. I do. Article 4, to see if the town will vote to raise and appropriate and or borrow and or transfer a sum of money to pay for the design of sidewalk improvements along Gay Street and other locations to be submitted to the Complete Streets Program and or other state or federal programs for approval and notice to proceed. To authorize the Board of Selectmen to enter into contracts for expenditure of any funds allocated or to be allocated by the Commonwealth and or federal agency for the design of said sidewalks and to meet said appropriation, appropriate the sum of $225,000 from free cash coming before the town meeting on the Finance and Warrant Commission's vote of 13 in favor and one opposed to recommend that the town so vote and requiring a majority vote. Is there a second? Second. Is there, and for this um, article, uh, Michael Gillette, town administrator, will um, uh, present for the town. Thank you. I want to make a brief presentation to just set the stage for what we're trying to accomplish here. Todd Korchin, the Director of Public Works, and Brendan Ryan, uh, the Deputy Director of Public Works, who have worked diligently with the consultants on this project, are here tonight also to answer any questions. Uh, the goal of the project that's before you, or this article before you tonight, is to seek funding to uh, complete a sidewalk along the full length of Gay Street to provide uh, safe pedestrian access connecting the two town centers. Uh, the red on either end of the yellow line uh, that's before you are the existing sidewalks in the town centers um, and the space in between with no red lines is the section of Westwood that is not connected and uh, the yellow line is the proposed connection. We've had a significant public process over the years. It began in 2016 when we appeared before town meeting for the first time to seek an appropriation of funds to conduct a survey of Gay Street so we could prepare conceptual plans. In 2017, when those conceptual plans were completed, there were two public hearings that were held, one on June, 2nd, uh, June 12th and the other on October 12th in 2017, where the conceptual plans were presented to residents of the community uh, in a public information session to receive comments on the proposed plan. And then subsequent to that, we had a public hearing before the Finance Commission uh, to discuss this article and why we want to bring it forward. In those public meetings, information sessions, there were several questions. The more important ones that were asked 
um, what, side of the, uh, what side of the street the sidewalk will be on, uh, how many trees will be impacted or have to be removed and or replaced, uh, will the existing stone walls uh, be disturbed, renovated, removed, or relocated? Um, will, the, will the right of way need to be expanded? How will the people cross Gay Street and Milk Street at the intersection? And what will the construction cost be? Um, the town will be able to answer these questions and others that have been asked uh, if, this public, if this process is able to move forward to full design. Um, we cannot answer you know, the, cost informa uh, the cost question without a full design so we can figure out what stone walls need to be replaced, what trees need to be, need to be moved or, or um, replanted. Uh, or uh, whether or not the right of way needs to be expanded. Tonight's article is to, to appropriate monies to fund the design and the design only. Um, there will be several opportunities during that process for additional public comment uh, and a public process. Um, maintaining the character of Gay Street and its aesthetics and providing safety for pedestrians are the two most important goals of the project. Construction funding will come from various sources and could possibly be done in phases. State funding is available through uh, the Complete Streets Project and the Safe Routes to Schools Project, and there may be other funding sources in the future, like Chapter 90 or um, uh, being listed on the TIP. Um, and then it could be augmented or additional matching funds coming from a town meeting process. This is just a picture of, uh, that was shown at the public hearing to discuss the safety and the, and the aesthetics. Uh, opportunities for public input, I'll just list out some, uh, not necessarily the only ones. At the 25%, we always hold a design hearing uh, where we uh, provide complete traffic data that's been collected, which includes volume, speed, and crash data. We'll have the initial design and the location or the options for the location of the sidewalk. And uh, we'll discuss some preliminary uh, presentations on ma maintaining the aesthetic quality of the street. At the 75% design, more detailed presentation uh, regarding the, the positioning of the sidewalk, because we have now we would now have made a decision on which side of the street, where the crossing points would need to be, and how we're going to preserve safety, and some Milk Street intersection pro, uh, improvements that we already know will need to be made, and we'll also have preliminary cost estimates by the 75 percent. The 100 percent design is then uh, primarily made before the board of selectmen to discuss uh, the final design that was selected and to, to make a determination where the funding will come from, uh, what portions will come from state funding, what portions will come from town meeting. And then the town meeting aspect, whether it's for funding or, uh, or uh, easements or public takings, will also have its public process finally ending again at a town meeting for a vote from town meeting. So we encourage you to uh, vote tonight to approve or to authorize the town to expend $225,000 of uh, free cash so we can continue with the design process uh, and continue with the discussion on how to uh, connect the two sides of town. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, good evening. My name is Michael Kraft. I reside at 30 Coach Lane. I'm also the chairman of the Pedestrian and Bicycle Safety Committee here in town. I wanna to thank you all of you for coming out tonight in this terrible weather. Um, on behalf of myself and my entire committee, I ask that you support this article to fund the design. Several years ago, Dave Atkins asked me to join him in reconstituting the Pedestrian and Bicycle Safety Committee. The committee was created by the Board of Selectmen 
to help make Westwood a more walkable and bikeable community by engaging residents and town departments in a sustainable and ongoing process of identifying needs, designing solutions, and implementing improvements. We had a small but dedicated group, and we had a vision. Our vision was to have sidewalks throughout town that would enable residents the ability to enjoy our beautiful spaces and environment on foot without risking life or limb walking in the middle of the busy streets. Now at the time we thought this was a pipe dream, but today I'm thrilled to be talking to you about the very real possibility of a sidewalk connecting Westwood Center with Islington, unifying the town and enabling safe passage all along this very busy thoroughfare. Now, why is this so important? Well, that falls into a few categories. First, health and safety. Kids walking to school or to see their friends can do so more easily and more safely. Younger kids on bicycles who really cannot use the streets because they're not yet equipped to do that can use a sidewalk. Parents who want to walk their children in strollers. Dog walkers, dogs as we all know, are not particularly bright about cars. Runners and walkers, I often see the high school teams running in the streets. I'm just wondering when we're gonna have an accident that's gonna have a problem. Accessibility for those with disabilities. This is a recreation opportunity that simply does not exist in our town. And the hope is not just to install these sidewalks, but for those of you who attended the informational meetings, we also hope to narrow Gay Street so as to lower average speeds of vehicles driving on the road. We'll also address some economic and social concerns. As I said, we'll unite the town, provide easier access to local businesses for those living close by so they don't have to get in their car to drive to a very difficult to find parking space. Better enjoyment of those town resources, reduce our driving and our carbon footprint so there are fewer buses perhaps needing to take kids to school. And we'll facilitate shopping, stopping at the post office or having an ice cream at the local neighborhood and then having the exercise to walk that off. Now let's compare ourselves to neighboring towns. Most of the surrounding towns are already fully equipped with sidewalks, and other towns to which we often compare ourselves, like Weston and Wellesley, all have embraced the need and desire to provide safe pedestrian access throughout their towns, and once built, they are used and they are enjoyed. The state has a Metropolitan Area Planning Council, or MAPC. It's an agency that works with local municipalities on a variety of environment and health, safety, and economic issues. MAPC provides local access scores for various streets throughout the region. These scores show how useful each road segment would be for people who are walking or biking from their homes to school, to shops and restaurants, parks and transit stations. Local access scores are calculated using a very sophisticated software that uses input that includes data about population, destinations where people drive and walk in any given day, and so forth. Well, MAPC has identified Gay Street with its highest local access score. And the important point about this, Gay Street is recognized not just here in Westwood, but at the state level as being a key transportation artery, both for pedestrians and bicyclists including, included with vehicles. Now, in the various meetings that we had leading up to this meeting, we did hear some arguments against a sidewalk on Gay Street. A couple of those, I think, are important to review at the moment. First is the worry that Gay Street is a beautiful street lined with trees and walls, woods, and fields, and that the visible aesthetics would be interrupted and diminished. Our committee, the Pedestrian Bicycle Safety Committee, is in complete agreement with that sentiment. That's the whole reason for the design, both for safety and aesthetics. Design elements can ameliorate the issues. First, there can be dyed concrete for the sidewalk that blends into the surrounding landscape. And a few minutes ago, we saw a picture of the fire station which has dyed concrete in the driveway. And it's a beautiful tan color, not the bright white that is so jarring. There can be appropriate landscaping between the sidewalk and the street. There can be amenities along the way, such as ben benches and bicycle racks, to encourage a more restful use of the resource. These ideas cannot be considered or incorporated until we get to this design stage, and that's where we are now. Some people have raised the question about trash being permitted to accumulate because of the pedestrians. I'm not sure what evidence there is to support this. What I've seen are drivers are the ones throwing trash out of their cars, not pedestrians. In fact, I see pedestrians picking up the trash, and certainly that's what I do when I'm walking. 
In conclusion, I want to ask all of you to please support this very important article. This will allow us to create a vision of the future of Westwood. This is good for safety, it's good for health, it's good for our economy, and most of all, it's good for our town. Thank you. Other discussion on Article 4? Anyone else who wants to speak on Article 4? Yes, um, in the back. I'm uh, Duncan McFarland, 299 Clapper Tree Street, uh, plus I own extensive land in, in, on Gay Street, uh, well over a quarter of a mile of, uh, of frontage. Uh, what my wife and I have done with our land there is we have put a conservation restriction on that land, the, the fields and the stone walls, et cetera. So uh, as long as the Constitution of the United States is good, it will look like that forever. It will never be developed, it can't be touched by law. I think this, this whole thing is, is government run amok. I don't think we'd be, we, this would not be a priority of the town if we didn't have the money available, uh, both at the town level and Others who want to be <laughs> others. Also, the, the town should know that any taking of, of private land will result in expensive litigation because that time machine will go on forever. Others who would like my microphone's not working. Can, can you put the mic on up front? Others who want to be recognized. My name is uh, Charlie Donahue. I was a Charles Seven. I live on Gay Street, 207. Uh, thank you, Duncan, for all you've done for the town and I respect your concerns. Uh, I go down Gay Street every day when I pull out of my driveway and I wince as they go by. Uh, school kids do jog. The high school cross country team goes down. Bicycle riders go down. It's a very it's already being used very dangerously by a lot of people in the town who want to enjoy it. But my greatest concern is safety. Uh, about five years ago, a woman was jogging on Winter Street and all the off sidewalks, and a truck driver just responsibly coming down the street, his mirror was out there and hit her in the head and killed her. Uh, it's a very, very dangerous thing that's happening if you go down Gate Street today. It, um, so my major concern living there is to make it safe for all the people who use it, the bicycle riders, the, the high school kids who do jog, Duncan's right, the regular little kids don't use it to go to school, they take buses. But it's, uh, it's really a threat to the safety of our town. It's also a beautiful street to enjoy the beauty. And you can't enjoy it driving by in a car. And I'm not threatened by people walking down the street to enjoy the beauty. So I'd strongly recommend at least getting more information. We're not making a decision tonight. We're just getting more information to judge it uh, again. But thank you for your time. Others who would like, hold, hold, hold on, no, hold on, there's a woman in back who wants to be recognized first. Can someone get her a microphone? And the microphones are not working. Marlis Schwartz, 32 Westwood Glen, 
I'd like to know, first of all, when a proposal to put in a sidewalk became government run amok. Um, secondly, do we have any guarantee that no school students are going to be moving onto Gay Street? And thirdly, if somebody gets hit riding a bicycle or walking down that street, I can guarantee you that we will have a lawsuit if we don't put in a sidewalk or something for pedestrians to use. Because, you know, it's dangerous to have people walking down the middle of the street. And if we vote against this and people get hurt, gosh, I, you know, if there's a lawsuit. Okay, thank you. <laughs> we got to get the microphones right. Testing. Okie doke. We are having technical difficulties this evening, aren't we? Um, Mr. Atkins. Hi, uh, David Atkins, 85 Parker Street. Um, I just wanted to say for the last, uh, last three weeks, I decided as a project to run Gay Street every day. So I've been running back and forth from Islington to, uh, to uh, 109, and um, I've logged about 100 miles run past uh, the properties of, of both these gentlemen. And I can tell you that uh, at 5.30 in the morning, it feels relatively safe because there aren't very many cars out there. But even on a Sunday afternoon or a Saturday afternoon, quiet day, uh, there are sections of the road where it truly is treacherous. And I know you can talk to this city runner, safe way to get from one part of town to the other. This will be a huge benefit to the town. I think that the design, the purpose of the design is to answer all of these concerns about civility and good aesthetics. And I think that it's something that we really need to do. I think it's something that will enhance the quality of life in this town. It'll connect the two sides of town. I imagine our kids may be going down from the nearest school to the library and they could walk home. You know, it's, I guess it's probably a 45 minute walk, but they, they can do that. And um, so I would strongly encourage you, encourage you to support this. I also noticed that as I've run up and down that street, I've seen a number of cyclists like, like myself. I ride the river from each run in the morning. There are other people like me out there running back and forth, um, and, uh, and people walking who are simply walking from like Thatcher to uh, like to the library probably. Um, it gets a lot of use. The kids who are on a cross country team running. There's a lot of use going on. I really think we can design a path that will, uh, that will serve the, the needs of this town. And so I strongly encourage you to support this article. Thank you. You need to come up to the microphone. And please state your name and address. Uh, Lucinda Lindy, 398 Dover Road. Uh, so I'm also a walker and a biker around town. and. Walking and biking along uh, Gay Street is very treacherous. It's ex almost, there's very little space uh, for cars and pedestrians and bicyclists to go by. Also, I was a mentor of a, uh, a team that did a fifth graders that biked around all the different parts of town, and they actually noted where it was good to bike and where it was very difficult. And their dream, these fifth graders from like eight years ago, uh, is to see the two parts of town connected so that they can bike from the library to other parts of town. It's not just about getting to school. Kids want to bike and giving them the opportunity to have a safe way to be healthy and get exercise is, I think, one of the things this town can do. So I ask everybody to please support for this uh, warrant. Other folks who want to be recognized, there's a woman here who needs a microphone. Micro microphone, please. Thank you. 
My name is Mary Layden. I live at 136 School Street. I just want to know, will the street be impacted for cars? Will it still be as wide? Or I just want to know about the cars. It's a narrow street already. Will they be taking anything from the street? Todd Corchin. How are you all? Uh, my name is Todd Corchin, Director of Public Works for the Town of Westwood. Um, as of right now, that's a tough question to answer because, again, we haven't invested in the formal design. Um, the conceptual layouts and things that we've discussed is perhaps limiting the lane widths. Currently, right now, they're a little over 11 feet, and we'd be reducing them perhaps to 10 feet, which is, as mentioned earlier tonight, a form of traffic calming as well. Um, I also wanted to um, say hello to Duncan. Uh, Duncan, I know we had this conversation. Mr. Corchin, I am just going to caution you that we don't personalize here. Okay. And so it's really important that we keep the, um, the tone and tenor of the debate um, okay. really focused on the facts. With respect to some of the comments made and some of the concerns from a couple of individuals in this room, and with the utmost respect that our department has for some of those individuals and everybody in this room, we understand the concerns. Um, I get it as well. I've been in the community. I'm 39 years old. I've been here for 39 years. I've lived here for about five grandparents. Uh, lived on Deerfield Ave, Westwood Glen, so on and so forth. Um, that aside, there's all of us in this room that care about the aesthetic values. I've been here driving around town for a number of years. I uh, care tremendously about what this town looks like. It is my job, our job, my department's job, to care deeply about what everything looks like in this town. And Gay Street, obviously, it's a scenic way. It's a beautiful, has a historic look to it. Um, it would be my my goal to maintain that. I understand that we have a number of feet of tumbled rock wall that's gorgeous. I understand that there's beautiful historic trees along Gate Street that are gorgeous. It's again our goal to maintain that and keep that level of consistency and keep Gate Street and the entire community as beautiful as possible. Um, this, is, this is an important article and what we're doing right now is taking a proactive approach, not potentially a reactive approach. We're tabling this for discussion right now. It's up to the town to decide which route you want to take. And this isn't construction, it is simply design. And all of these answers, all of these concerns, Milk Street, how many trees, what are the walls going to look like, how wide are the lanes exactly going to be, what color is the, cross, uh, the, the sidewalk going to be, these will be answered with this investment. Or we could continue to just get conceptual layouts and spend money and say, well, this is what could it be, or this, this might be what it looks like. I'd rather come back and have our public meetings at 25%, sit down with the residents, sit down with the community and say, here's where we are. This is a 25% design. What are your thoughts? And at that point, solicit the feedback. Come back at 75% and say, you know what? We were able to take a couple of comments and thoughts and incorporate them into the 75% design. Or perhaps we couldn't, but this is why. Then we come back at 100%, bring it before the Board of Selectmen, and let them weigh in. It's a very inclusive process. This isn't going to be anything that anybody's going to be blindsided with, and by no means is a sidewalk going to be constructed within the next 12 months. It's just not, it's not going to happen that way. So I appreciate everybody's consideration, and I hope that answers some of the questions as best I can. Thank you. Thank you. There's, um, there's a person up here who needs a microphone. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kate Wynn, 10 Cedar Hill Drive. Um, I appreciate everyone's comments tonight about the sidewalk. I just have a, um, a perspective on it that I haven't heard voiced yet. So I wanted to just mention, um, I have a middle schooler and a high schooler, and um, they go to school and they learn about lockdown and they learn about shelter in place. Um, they learn these really important things about how to keep themselves safe. But should there be an event at the middle school or the high school, how do they get home? You know. They would have to wait for, for someone, for me, for whoever, to come get them and bring them home because there isn't a safe way for them to get home. So I, I appreciate you know, everything people have, have um, mentioned, but as an individual family, our disaster recovery plan has a gap, and this might satisfy that gap. Thank you. Okay, with that, we'll, um, are there other folks that want to speak? And again, at this point, really, um, new items that have not been discussed in the past. Yes, there's a woman in, did you want to, still want to speak? Kayla Closey, 31 Beacon Street. I'm also a member of Bike Pedestrian Safety Committee since 2010. 
Um, I would like to add more when it, uh, in regards of uh, um, the other benefits of sidewalks that reduces the crime risk through increased pedestrian traffic. Also, it does improve access to buses. It does enhance the sense of community. Besides uh, those benefits, we don't forget about the economic benefits. A study by the Urban Land Institute shows home buyers are willing to pay more for homes in walkable neighborhoods. Real Estate Research Corporation, Corporation analysis shows property values rise fastest in pedestrian friendly areas. Sidewalks improve access to business and industry for employees relying on public transportation. Also, at the same time, the health benefits that pretty much everybody covered um, or, uh, before me. At the same time, um, people living in the neighborhood with sidewalks um, are 47% more likely to be active for at least 39 minutes a day more than people without sidewalks, living in the neighborhood without sidewalks. Um, at the same time, a higher walk uh, score can increase the property values anywhere between 4,000 to 34,000 for a residential property or from 9% to 54% per square foot for a commercial property. That is depending on the level of change on walkability. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Pervetier, if you want to speak, you need a microphone. And we will, I saw two other hands up, and then we'll, um, we'll call the question. Thank you, Alice. First, I'd like, Joe Pervetier is 16 Dean Street. First, I'd like to thank the selectmen, the DPW, and the Bicycle Safety Committee, Mr. Kraft's group. Uh, I support this article 100%. I believe ped pedestrian safety should be paramount in our community. In the 70s, I was given a great opportunity. I had the distinct honor to become a member of the Westwood Fire Department as a firefighter EMT. If you look around the room tonight, you see some police officers and some firefighters. If you ask those men and women, I can guarantee you that they will share with you an incident or incidents that they will never forget. I unfortunately had one of those incidents involving a young man named Danny Mulgrew. Danny lived on Russell Ave and he was on his way home from basketball practice at the Thurston Middle School. We received a call for a pedestrian struck by a car in front of the Thurston Middle School and I responded to that call, my partner Rocky Morrison, who was a great vet and a great firefighter, a great deputy chief. We found the young man with a rapid heart rate that we lost, weak and shallow breathing, and I remember it like it was yesterday. We began CPR immediately, and we continued it all the way to Norwood Hospital. The year at that time was much smaller. We swung directly into the uh, trauma bay, and uh, we left the room while they worked on resuscitating Danny. Rocky and I were down the hall completing our report and getting the stretcher ready, and I heard Kathleen's Mulgrew's wails. She didn't sob, she didn't cry, she wailed when she learned she had lost her son. And I don't believe any parent should have to go through that type of suffering, and as a 20-year-old, I will never forget it. I salute Todd for his hard work on this. I appreciate the work the selectmen have done on this. And lastly, in case you're wondering, that spring, the town installed the sidewalk where Danny had slipped off the snow banking onto High Street. Todd said it best, we should be proactive. Thank you all very much. Okay, this person right here, can we get a microphone there? Please state your name and address. John Rogers, uh, 107 School Street. So I run on the cross country team, and I think there's a lot of room it's not your fault. Um, and there's plenty of room on the side of the road to run. It's pretty wide. And we all know that it's probably going to turn out really ugly, and that's a beautiful fall drive. 
Um, so I'd really hate to see that happen in our town. And is there any real evidence that a sidewalk makes anything safer? Like, does anyone have really hard facts or statistics on this? Because I think it's just an emotional support here. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think it's a good idea, and I don't have any support for it. Thank you. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, my name's Lucius Hill. I live at 519 Gay Street. Um, I'd like to urge voters to op oppose this motion. Uh, you know, one of the things that's really important to me about Westwood is th that unlike some of the towns in the area, it retains more of a country feel, and I think neighborhoods like Gay Street are, are a big part of that with the open fields, the trees, and the stone walls, as has been discussed. Now, in my mind, a, a sidewalk, which is essentially a big slab of concrete running the whole length of the street, is going to compromise that aesthetic. You just can't get around it. Uh, a grassy curb and a stone wall is one look. Uh, you know, a 10-inch high, high slab of concrete is another, whatever its color of dye may be. I also feel that you don't need to do a design study to realize that the part of Gay Street that's east of Milk Street, where the road narrows and the, and the trees and wall are very close to the street, there's going to have to be walls moved and trees cut down throughout that area to accommodate a sidewalk. You can verify this just by driving down that street. That is also going to change the aesthetics of the area when you move the walls and take the trees down. So, uh, and uh, the other point I'd make is those walls you're moving, those trees you're cutting down are on somebody's property, somebody who's maintained them or planted the trees or whatever, and those homeowners will be inconvenienced when this sidewalk goes in. Uh, again, as has been mentioned, there aren't children on the street that are going to be walking to school. And, you know, I've lived there for more than 20 years. I can't remember an accident for a runner or a bicyclist on Gay Street. So I, I'm not sure the safety question is really uh, an overwhelming driver here. So for the town to spend a whole bunch of money to impair the aesthetics of one of its uh, m many beautiful neighborhoods, uh, I think would be a mistake, and I'd urge uh, folks to vote against this motion. Okay, with that, I'm going to call the question. Again, this is Article 4, um, having to do with um, funding to pay for the design of sidewalk improvements along Gay Street. This does require a majority vote and is before town meeting on the FinCom recommendation that the town so vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. It is a majority vote in favor. <laughs> Article 5. To see if the town will vote to approve certain amendments to the Westwood Zoning Bylaw to add definitive caps on the number of residential dwelling units which may be constructed in flexible multiple use overlay district 6 and 7 by amending section 9.5. This comes before the town meeting on the Finance and Warren Commission's unanimous vote and recommendation that the town approve Article 5 and does require a two-thirds vote. At this time, Trevor Lobenstein will present the planning board's report for this town meeting, which is applicable to Articles 5, 10, 11, and 12. Mr. Lobenstein. And a motion to amend is not in order at this time. Good evening. Uh, my name is Trevor Lobenstein. I'm the chairman of the planning board. I'm also a resident of 375 Clapboard Tree Street in Westwood. Um, in compliance with Mass General Laws, Chapter 40A, Section 5, the Planning Board held a public hearing on the four zoning amendment articles 5, 10, 11, and 12 on October, October 3, 2017, continued the hearings until October 17, October 24, and November 7. On November 7, the Planning Board voted 4 to 1 to recommend the town meeting vote to approve Article 5 as presented in the warrant. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
So at this time, I just want to make sure that um, it, to, um, that the FinCom has recommended unanimously that the town so vote and make sure that I did have a second on that motion. Okay, great. Just check in. It does require a two-thirds vote. Um, and did someone have an amendment to that vote? That would be in order now. Okay. Do you have something in writing, ma'am? Thank you. Um, just to update everybody, there is an amendment to the article that um, we just need town council to review. And we will get right back to you. The amendment is filed would change the number 90 to 35, and town council has a, um, a, a ruling to make on that. To properly amend a zoning article, uh, particularly with an amendment that has not gone through the public hearing, that the article itself went through, there are certain restrictions. It's my opinion that the amendment is beyond the scope of the article. And I say that because it changes the identity or the substantial character of the article. It fundamentally departs from the original proposal and it radically differs from the original proposal. I would advise the moderator that the amendment is out of order and should not be considered. So at this, at this time, the amendment is out of order and cannot be considered. Um, we, um, for the reasons that town council has articulated, and so we will proceed with the, um, with the discuss any further discussion. Ma'am, did you want to be recognized? Our question. You just need to state your name. Good and evening, address. and thank you, Ms. Moderator. Yes. My name is Nada Milosavljevic Fabrizio, and I reside at 32 Webster Street. And with all due respect, it's not up to anyone gathered here to decide the legal validity of my amendment. 
That decision rests solely with the Attorney General of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So I don't understand how I'm out of order. So the, the ruling... The <laughs> to be clear, the ruling is not on the legality of the amendment. The ruling is on the um, process and the charter and the bylaws of the town. Ultimately, the Attorney General might decide that this is not a, a, an appropriate amendment, but for the purposes of this town meeting and the article that is before us, which has gone through an extensive public hearing process and is before us on the, um, with the number 90 in it, um, to change that number 90 would substantially change the article and would mean that that would need to go back for a complete new public hearing be, uh, in the process that has gone forward. That is why the amendment is ruled out of scope. It is not, it is not a ruling on legality. It is a ruling on procedure and, um, and town meeting. And so with all due respect, I appreciate you disagree, but that is the ruling of the moderator. Is there any further discussion on Article 5? Yes. Mr. Greenberg. Rich Greenberg, 20 Carver Street. Um, I'm assuming that Article 5 and 6 and perhaps more are somewhat interconnected. I was wondering if you could... Hello? I said I'm assuming that, that Article 5 and 6 are somewhat interconnected. And I was wondering since this is basically about what's going on in Islington Center with the construction and the potential construction with the CVS and so on, in light of what's already taken place there, could someone please give us a quick overview of what the scope of this article is trying to do or not do in terms of the, um, the, the scope and the size of what we might end up with in Islington because that's really the main concern that I have. Ms. Lochnane. Nora Lochnane, 74 Sterling Road, and I'm also the Director of Community and Economic Development. I drafted Article 5 at the request of the Selectmen. The Board of Selectmen understood from meetings over the past several months that there was confusion about what the Flexible Multiple Use Overlay District bylaw could allow and what it could not allow. So first I'd like to explain what it can allow. The planning board is permitted under that article to consider special permit applications that would involve a portion of a project as residential and a portion of commercial. The existing bylaw limits the portion that's residential to no more than 50% of the overall floor area of a project. So if you think of a two-story building, one story could be a commercial use, the other story could be a residential use. Both stories could not be residential, but both stories could be commercial. So the limit is on residential, and it's a limit of 50%. That's what the existing bylaw says. What the selectmen heard from residents was that there was concern that we could see six or 700 residential units appear on Washington Street if the planning board was willing to grant special permits to allow that. I'd stated at several Islington Task Force meetings and at a couple of selectmen meetings that that simply is not the case. There are limits on construction based on the topography of a parcel, the size of the parcel, the parking requirements, the landscaping requirements, and various other components that are spelled out in the <coughs> FMUOD bylaw. But people didn't understand as clearly as we'd hoped what the 50% limit amounted to. So the selectmen proposed this article that puts in a cap of 90 units in the Washington Street FMUOD district and 90 units on the High Street FMUOD district. They then asked the planning board to co-sponsor the article with them, and the planning board did so and recommended that the FinCom uh, recommend town meeting approval of this. The article was taken to FinCom and was supported there as well. So the motion that's before you is to approve the article. This, if this article is approved by two-thirds vote, what will happen is the bylaw that currently now limits a residential development in a flexible multiple use overlay district to no more than 50% of an entire project will be further limited to no more than 90 units in either of those districts. It's important to note that 
by saying further limited, while it places a definitive cap on it, that cap does not appear to be any less than, than what the 50% would result in if applications came forward. And that doesn't mean that the planning board will approve 90 units on Washington Street or 90 units on High Street. What it means is that the planning board can consider applications for mixed use developments in either of those districts that allow a property to be used for 50% residential until they reach that cap of 90 units. At that point, they would not be able to consider an application for a residential use in that district. Other comments on Article 5? Yes. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, Peter Young, 603 High Street. I guess I have a question about the 50%. The building that was built over in Islington now, which doesn't affect me because I live on the other side of town, but I'm just curious, is it would seem that the residential portion of that building is more than 50% of the commercial um, space, but maybe that's just um, my guess that there's two floors above one floor. So I guess I would have a question on that. Ms. Lochner. The project you're referring to is 301 to 323 Washington Street, and that project actually includes the single story building that houses Islington Pizza, Wild Blossom, um, Birdie's Creative Creamery, a yoga shop, and a, a post office. That single story building amounts for a portion of the commercial use, because that there's nothing in that building other than commercial use. And then the, the mixed use building next to it, which is part of the same project, has one floor of commercial use and two floors of residential use. The overall project is exactly 50% of the square area is residential, and 50% of the floor area is commercial. Other questions, uh, comments? Yes. Oh, there's two people, sorry. Did I see two people? Yeah. Okay, so first um, the man in the front and then the man in the back. My name's uh, Danny Waldman, 24 Whitewood Road. Um, I am in commercial real estate, and I'm telling you as a professional broker, I think this is a terrible idea. You, you go down to Roach Street, you have 90 units, the, par the, the traffic will be terrible. And um, I just can't understand how the fire department would allow this with all these additional cars. So uh, 2016, I sold over $100 million in real estate, so I know what I'm talking about. And as a 20-year resident of Westwood, uh, I can't believe we're even talking about 90 units. Yes, in the back. Uh, Brian Hardeman, 40 Westdale Road. Um, my question is, through you, Mrs. Moderator, to the uh, town council, what number would be within the um, article, scope of the article, to amend it down to? So I can probably answer that, um, although town council is welcome to as well. Um, the, the challenge here is that the zoning board process um, requires a specific process, and that includes um, notice to abutters, public hearings, all of which is what this article went through to get to this point. And so the, um, the change is a material change to the amendment. And there are times when you make a change that is material, so all, any change, any number that would have changed here on town meeting floor, would have, it is um, subject to uh, reopening the process and going back before the, um, for the zoning board process. And so effectively using the guidelines established by the Attorney General, um, also the um, standard procedures that we have here in the town, both in the charter and the bylaws, um, requires that result. And I do understand there's disagreement with that um, I appreciate that, but as the moderator, that those are the rulings that I am charged to make on behalf of town meeting. Okay, can I ask a follow-up question then? 
Sure. So the uh, article says not to exceed a maximum of 90 dwellings. Correct? Right. So we're not asking for to amend it to more, which would change the scope of the article. The amendment, I believe, was for less. So I, it's up to a maximum of. So anything within that zero to 90, in my opinion, would be within the article. And I, I do appreciate that. But The challenge and the and the laws and the rules that apply are any change that you make that is a substantial change. And here, um, that is a substantial change. And so, you certainly, as a voter, can vote for or against the article. Um, but this amendment is not in order at this time. Thank you, Ms. Lofting. Just want to make a, a point of clarification. The Article that's proposed now is to amend an existing bylaw. The bylaw as written allows 50% of a project to be residential. What this bylaw does is imposes a clarification that, that, can, that the planning board can grant a special permit only up until that 90th unit is permitted. So in a sense, it gives you a, cell, uh, a cap on what you could see in either of these districts. If the article is passed, that 90 unit cap is applied in both Washington Street and High Street. If the article is not passed, the 50% limit remains in place. The planning board can consider a special permit. That doesn't mean the planning board will grant a special permit for any application. There are currently no applications before the board, though there is one expected in the near future. You've heard about the Islington Center Redevelopment Project that the town is considering. Um, there's a public-private partnership between the town and Petruziello Properties that would involve parcels of privately owned land and town owned land. That's expected to come to the planning board in the near future, and that is, is expected to be a mixed-use project with some portion of residential uses. The planning board would consider the application under the existing bylaw, which currently allows 50% of a, a project's floor area to be residential. Um, Mr. Greenberg, did you speak on this already? Yeah, there's someone behind you that wants to speak as well. Dave, right in front. Oh. Maria Costantini, 15 Spalman Road. So given where we are now, it seems to me that this number 90 is uh, coming out of a hat. Uh, it's not clear why it's not 96 or 85, how you came up. So, um, but if you say on a number, a developer will assume that that number is allowed. So my sense is that allowing some confusion as it is in the current bylaw is our best chance now, and then we have a chance uh, uh, during the permitting to, to voice uh, our concern. My, my suggestion would be to vote against uh, this amendment. Ms. Lefney? I'd like to explain how we came up with a number of 90 for each district. What we did was we looked at all of the properties, first in the Washington Street District and then in the High Street District. In each case, we looked at them assuming the most advantageous combination of properties to a developer, so combining all the lots that are contiguous to each other, eliminating any setback requirements or landscape requirements, assuming the least amount of parking that could be required, and assuming the smallest size residential units that could be developed to achieve the maximum number of units. Taking all of those factors into consideration, I came up with a figure of up to 149 units that could be developed in the Washington Street District and up to 119 units that could be developed in the High Street District. Then I looked more closely at those numbers and took into consideration the parcel's likelihood of being combined, their likelihood of being developed, their topography, and the planning board's right to require specific public amenities on the properties. And I reduced both of the figures to 90 because I believe that that is a more fair estimate of what could be achieved if each property owner in the district submitted an application with a couple of exceptions. One is Roach Brothers. So in the Washington Street District, 
while I calculated that including the Roach Brothers property, we could come up with 149 um, residential units there, I think it's highly unlikely that the Roach Brothers property will be redeveloped in that manner in the near future. And if it is, I believe it will be a special project that would go through a much more lengthy review by the town and would come back to town meeting. On the high street area, I believe parcels are more um, in a position to be redeveloped closer to the numbers that I had calculated. So I believe the 90 unit out of 119 possible units is just more likely. And the reason for that is the topography, the layout, and the ownership of these units. There are parcels that are in, already in single ownership. And there are parcels like the Stagecoach Plaza, which already has a second level, that could be converted to residential use. There's no proposal to do that, but it could be done. So I gave more credence to the ability to, to construct more units, at a, a lot higher percentage of the units on the High Street side than the Washington Street side. But the numbers were not pulled out of the air. That said, this was not a full engineered study. There are multiple ways of developing all parcels. It, depending on the shape and the size of the building that you construct, where you put the driveways in and out, um, whether there are wetlands on the parcels or steep slopes, that can affect the numbers. But I believe that we came up with the, the best approach for estimating what could be allowed under the current zoning and giving a cap that would give people a sense of um, comfort that we are not talking about six or 700 units on High Street or Washington Street. It's a lesser number than that. 90 may sound like more units than you could ever imagine going there, but the current zoning bylaw could allow that by special permit if the planning board approved projects. In order for the planning board to approve the projects, though, it's worth noting that they would have to consider the special permit applications according to the bylaw. The bylaw has very specific design and performance criteria. It requires traffic studies, environmental studies, drainage studies, all of those studies would be considered in a public format, and they would have to prove, the applicant would have to prove to the planning board that the project was advantageous to the town and not detrimental to the neighborhood surrounding it. So you, it's a high bar that you'd have to reach before a special permit could be granted. Yes, in the back. Kevin Becker, 1227 High Street. Uh, my understanding was that the planning board vote to approve this was four to one. Uh, if, if that's the case, could, it, could we possibly hear from the person who voted against this and why? Uh, Brian Gorman, 145 School Street, member of the planning board. Uh, the reason why I voted no is because, as Nora just mentioned, the 90 seemed like the most reasonable number that would likely happen. So the way I looked at it is, why are we even voting on this at all? It really doesn't achieve anything in my mind considering what uh, the vote turned out in the spring meeting with regards to the desire for additional apartment units on High Street in Washington. Uh, I'm definitely concerned about High Street. Uh, it seems to be coming up more and more in conversation. Um, it seemed to only be an Islington type of conversation, um, but now it seems to be more in the ether. Uh, so what I was hoping for, I like this type of article, and I'm on record as saying that. My hope was that as it went through the different departments in the town, that that, that cap was going to come down. Because again, if it's reasonable that that's the, the more likely number, then why are we even voting on it? It seems like this would be something to add to the bylaw just so that the residents would have an understanding of what is likely. Um, and I don't know of any other uh, bylaw that we have in the book that does this type of measure. Um, I, I actually would like to see more articles coming to the town which has more to do with um, people seem to be concerned about density of buildings and green space. Um, I, I recommend that you email your town representatives to tell them what type of articles you'd like to see in the future to preserve the town that, uh, that you decided to live in. Thank you. Okay. At this point, um, I, I will recognize you again, and then I'm going to call the question. Thank you, Ms. Moderator. 
Nada Milosavljevic, Fabrizio, 32 Webster Street. I think I'm not an evil person. I'm not opposed to revitalization of our town centers um, or what's being referred to in these public meetings as FMUOD District 6 and 7. I think it's extremely important to note that the current owner and the developer, one and the same person, of the property in FMUOD 6, also known as Islington Center, for the people that don't recognize the term FMUOD, and I'm sorry, I'm supposed to be addressing the moderator. The owner purchased the property on or, on or about December 23rd, 2014, which was well before this whole FMUOD designation started somewhere around 2015. Therefore, it is simply impossible for the owner to have had any kind of a reasonable expectation that the subject property would ever be zoned for mixed use or residential use. And that's all I have to say, thank you. Okay, I do see two hands up. Um, Selectman Hyde. Yes, Ms. Schwartz, I will recognize you after the speaker. Uh, good evening, Nancy Hyde, 15 Martin Gale Lane, member of the Board of Selectmen. I just want to bring us back to the reason this article was put forward. This was our hope to be responsive to people who expressed significant concerns that the zoning that had been approved by a prior town meeting by the threshold of two-thirds of the people present, which allowed for residential, subject to the 50% of the building space. We were concerned that people said it could be six, 700 units. Practically speaking, that didn't make sense. This was our hope to provide clarity. The 50% still applies, the number 90 was simply to provide clarity. If you don't feel the need for that clarity, that's okay, the article will stay as is. We were just trying to hopefully help people get over the concern that there could be a substantially larger number of housing units, which in our assessment, planning board's assessment, when they designed this zoning that was then approved, never envisioned a, a really large six, 700 number of units. So that's really what it comes down to, and I just wanted to have you all understand that. Thank you. Ms. Schwartz. My name is Mar Marvelous Schwartz, and I live at 32 Westwood Glen Road. I, I rent. I understand that I hear people talking about renters as if we had some kind of plague. I pay, part of my rent pays for property taxes here in Westwood. When I shop, I shop here in Westwood. I bring money into the town. I don't have a car. Most of the people in Westwood Glen and Highland Glen don't have cars. We rely on, on the ride and the COA ride. So we're not polluting the streets exactly. Uh, why do you hate us? I, I, I do, I get the feeling people talk about renters as, as if we polluted the whole town just by existing. And I, I just don't understand it. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Schwartz. Yes. Um, with that, uh, Mr. Greenberg, do you have something additional to add? Yes, Mr. Greenberg. Um, okay, now that I understand what's going on, I, I just wanted to say that I'm a little uneasy about the whole thing for the following reason. When, when we vote on something, you assume that you're, you, you have a certain assumption of what you're voting on. And people keep using the phrase 50% of the building space. To me, that what, means, what that means is if I'm building a building right here, that whatever's on the bottom floor, that's what I can use on the top floor. 
And now what you said was, well, we, we used the building next door because it didn't have a second floor so we could add a third floor. That's not the intent when you vote for something. Years ago, when they built the middle school gym, we voted on a new gym, okay? When everybody who was voting assumed we were gonna get a new basketball gym. And then when we found out later that it was too small, and the person who designed it said, well, you asked for a new gym, I gave you a new physical education gym. That's not what we assumed. Mr. Greenberg, I just need you to get back to this article. So okay, that we well, can I'm keep saying that, uh, that bottom line is that the, the article or the, what, we, what we vote on, we need to have a clear understanding of what we're voting on because clearly that was um, somewhat of a um, misunderstanding or you know, misleading um, question. Right. And I don't want it to happen across the street or where CVS is now. I don't have a problem with apartments, just, that's, just the density. And, and please um, vote you know, the, the way that you're comfortable voting. I, I do want to caution and remind folks, though, that these articles go through an incredible amount of public process. And so it is not a surprise that they come before here um, at town meeting. And I do encourage folks to really um, learn about what's on the dockets for the planning board for the uh, you know for all of the the, uh, the finance and warrant commission because they work really hard to present um, issues for us and um, you know you you are town meeting and you have the vote and um, and now I'm going to call the vote on article five so with that just to remind you we are voting on article five it is before town meeting on the FinCom's um, unanimous recommendation that the town so vote. The um, vote requirement here, because this is a, a bylaw amendment, is a two-thirds vote. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. no. Okay, I am going to ask for a standing vote. All those in favor, please stand and remain standing. I remind you that only registered voters can vote, and you do need to be in the registered voter area, not in the visitor section. So if there are some registered voters up in the visitor section, please do come down and do remain still and standing. Again, this is those who are standing are those who are in favor of approving Article 5. I am going to ask once again that people do not move. Only, only counters will be moving at this time. So all of those who are in favor are standing and standing still. Please remain standing and do not move.
Okay. Those who voted yes may sit, and those who vote no may stand and have a little bit of a stretch, please. So anyone standing now is voting no on Article 5. Again, if you're standing, you're voting no on Article 5. Okay, you may be seated. The yes vote was 114, the no vote was 112. The article is defeated. Sorry. The yes vote was 144. The no vote was 112. Article five is defeated. Article six coming on a citizen's petition article to see if the town will vote to rescind the vote taken on Article 29 at the annual town meeting on May 2nd, 2016. This, um, this article is, uh, has the lead petitioner, Stephen Barrett, from 230 School Street. This comes before town meeting on the Finance and Warrant Commission's unanimous vote recommending that the town vote indefinite postponement. And the quantum of vote on the FinCom's recommendation of indefinite postponement is a majority vote. On indefinite postponement, um, the FinCom votes indefinite postponement in instances where um, they are voting no on the underlying substance of the article or there may not be enough information to, um, to vote yes. And in this instance, we look to the FinCom's recommendation for an explanation of the FinCom's vote. With that, is there a second? Is there any discussion on Article 6? Yes. 
Seeing no discussion on Article 6. I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Please state your name and address. Okay, Any, anyone else want to be heard on this article? Seeing and hearing no discussion. Coming before town meeting on the um, Finance and Warrant Commission's um, recommendation that the town um, confirm its vote on indefinite postponement and a, a majority vote required. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. I cannot tell if it's a majority vote or not. Um, so let's stand. If you are confirming the uh, recommendation for indefinite postponement, so if you are voting for indefinite postponement, please stand. Again, registered voters. You are standing if you are voting in favor of indefinite postponement. Okay, those um, who just voted can sit, and those who are against indefinite postponement. If you oppose indefinite postponement, please stand and stay standing.
Okay, you may be seated. The vote is 136 yes, 94 no. This is a majority vote, so um, the motion for indefinite postponement passes, and we will move on to Article 6, 7. Article 7, to see if the town will vote to amend the Westwood Town Bylaw 138-17 by deleting sections F, G, and H in their entirety and replacing it with primary vote of town meeting shall be by electronic voting. If the number of voters exceeds the number of voting devices, pursuant to Mass General Laws Chapter 39, Section 10, the moderator shall designate an overflow room for vote by show of hands and shall appoint an assistant moderator pursuant to General Laws Chapter 39, Section 14, to preside at and regulate proceedings in overflow room or take any other action thereon. This comes before, this is a citizen petitioner article sponsored by Ellen Rawlings at 86 Green Hill Road. This comes before town meeting on the Finance and Warrant Commission's unanimous vote recommending that the town vote indefinite postponement and does require a majority vote. So in the first instance, this is before town meeting on FinCom's motion for indefinite postponement. Is there a second? Second. second. Is there any discussion on indefinite postponement? Yes. You, uh, indefinite postponement cannot be amended. Other comments? Again, this comes before town meeting on the Mo FinCom's motion for indefinite postponement. At, that, at this time, seeing no further discussion. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. no. It is a majority vote in favor of uh, approving the motion for indefinite postponement. Article 8. To see if the town will vote to raise, appropriate, and transfer from any available funds in the Treasury the sum of $20,000 to purchase an electronic voting system for use at town meeting with 350 handheld units or take any other action thereon. This is, excuse me, we do need to have people able to hear. This comes before town meeting on the Finance and Warren Commission's vote, unanimous vote recommending that the town vote indefinite postponement is a citizen's petitioner article from Ellen Rawlings at 86 Green Hill Road. Motion for indefinite postponement does require a majority vote. Is there a second? second? Is there any discussion on Article 8? Seeing and hearing no discussion on Article 8, all those, in, and again, a majority vote is required. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. It is a majority vote in favor. Article 9. To see if the town will vote to amend the Westwood Town Bylaw 138-15D1 by inserting the following language after the wording, considered the main motion excluding citizen petitions. The sponsor of a citizen petition shall make the first motion and said motion shall be considered the main motion of that article or take any other action thereon. This is a citizen petitioner article sponsored by Deborah Conant at 21 Strasser Ave. This comes before town meeting on the Finance and Warrant Commission's vote of 12 in favor and two opposed to recommend that the town vote indefinite postponement. Indefinite postponement requires a majority vote. Is there a second? Is there any discussion on the motion for indefinite postponement for Article 9? Yes, Ms. Conant. You, you, need, you need a microphone. Thank you. So, which one can I fly? No, it was on. It, it was on. Oh, that's fine. Can you hear me? Um, this article basically is just to. Uh, Debbie Conian, Strasser Ave. Um, this article basically is just to get rid of indefinite postponement. 
so we can get to the core of the articles that are being voted on so that we can discuss them and it makes it a yes or no vote. So that is just what the article is about and if you vote indefinite postponement of this, we can't talk about it, but if you support this and you vote no on indefinite postponement, we can bring the article to the floor and vote on it. Any other discussion about um, Article 8? Nine, sorry, Article Nine. Yes. I apologize, Ms. Moderator, thank you. My name is Nada Milosavovic Fabrizio, and I reside at 32 Webster Street, and I decided not to get up because I keep interrupting this gentleman on my left. Um, contrary to the Finance and Warrant Commission's suggestion that this article will serve to create confusion among residents with respect to town meeting procedure, clearly its purpose is to serve as a mechanism to simplify our voting procedure here by calling for an up or a down, either a yes or a no vote. Undeniably, it's the term indefinite postponement that creates the confusion. My claim is indeed validated by members of the Finance and Warming Commission during discussions at last month's October 17th open public meeting. During that recent meeting, members acknowledged that in fact confusion does exist, as evidenced in the state but statement by one commission member who said, and I quote, indefinite postponement, I know is confusing. It's this term, together with the series of action necessitated by the use of this term, indefinite postponement, that absolutely creates a cognitive barrier, preventing a clear understanding of town meeting procedural voting, in that it requires a two-vote approach in order for participants in town meeting to first be able to reject the Finance Commission's recommendation in order to subsequently have to take a second vote on the same article to have any chance of success in passing a petitioner's article. Indeed, there's nothing complicated in having a yay or a nay vote, and I reiterate, reiterate my support of this article. Thank you. Other comments on this motion for indefinite postponement? Mrs. Prevotera. Christine Prevotero, 16 Dean Street. I just want to express my opinion that this article is a very good article for some of the reasons stated before. And if a person goes through all the effort to write an article on his or her own rather than a board's article and then not be able to speak first but to have just an indefinite postponement from the FinCom, and all of a sudden you know, the whole body here thinks, okay, it's a no, because indefinite postponement is basically no, as if you come to meetings, you know that. That is not fair to the petitioner. The petitioner should be able to speak first. Thank you. Other comments on indefinite postponement? Seeing none, um, this, is, this comes before town meeting on the Finance and Warren Commission's motion for indefinite postponement and recommendation that the town so vote, requiring a majority vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. Um, it will be a standing vote. Um, all those in favor of indefinite postponement, please stand.
Okay, you may sit. And those who vote no on indefinite postponement, those who are opposed to indefinite postponement, please stand. Folks can, cannot leave until after the question has been um, finalized. It's hard for us to count when people are um, standing and leaving during a vote. So please just stand still or sit still, as the case may be. Those who are standing now are opposed to indefinite postponement. You may be seated. The yes vote was 90, the no vote was 112, indefinite postponement fails. So at this time there would need to be a motion put before town meeting because there is no motion before town meeting at this time. Yes. Did someone speaking? Yes. Okay, gotcha. Sorry about that. Can you hear me? Okay. Apologies. Um, I make a motion to move the article. Is that to approve the article? Okay, and that needs a second. Okay. Um, those wanting to speak on the article. This is a, uh, this, this article requires a two-thirds vote. Ms. LeBanc. Good evening, Mary Ann LeBlanc, for Chickadee Lane, Chair of FinCom. I appreciate the opportunity to address you on this important matter. Uh, the first thing I'd like to address is what was said earlier about discussion we've been having on FinCom about indefinite postponement. And it was very accurately stated that we have been aggressively addressing that issue and we do believe that there is sometimes confusion about what a vote for indefinite postponement is. Sometimes it means that we think the article is bad for the town. Sometimes it may mean that we think the article before us is premature in some way. For example, electronic voting. We thought as a body that electronic voting is a great idea to investigate, but that we thought more work needed to be done before it was actually implemented at town meeting. And I, I think we've seen that that is the case this evening. Uh, sometimes indefinite uh, postponement uh, could mean that we think there needs to be more study on an issue. So it can mean many things, and that is something that we'd like all of the people in town to understand and to read our write-ups, which further explain the reason for our vote. Uh, however, when it comes to this article before you, it seeks to change the procedure that is laid out in our town bylaws. As you know, each article that is presented to town meeting comes before you 
on a FinCom motion. That is our motion either to recommend or for indefinite postponement. And in that regard, you, the townspeople, know that an independent body that is appointed, we are independent, we represent a cross-section of town, uh, we are not elected, uh, each motion comes to you with that objectivity uh, and that you can have some trust in, in terms of an independent body having uh, very carefully studied the issue before you. To change that process with respect to a petitioner's article, and I must say I have great respect for people who bring petitioner articles. A member of my own family has done so in the past, and I know that it is a difficult uh, thing to do, uh, and it's a brave thing to do. Uh, but this would change the way a petitioner's article would come to the, the town because that motion would be made to the town without the benefit of the FinCom uh, motion. Moreover, I do think if we treat some articles differently than we do others at town meeting, that that would likely create even more confusion than people may have to begin with. So for that reason, I think I've encapsulated the reasons why FinCom uh, voted indefinite postponement on the article before you. Thank you very much. Seeing no further discussion, um, and to be clear, this is a vote on the underlying article, Article 9. Can I speak? Um, sure. Go ahead. Um, thank you. I, my name is Debbie Conant, and I'm the petitioner on this article. Um, I want people to understand that um, this is allowable in town meeting times, which is the parliamentary law that we follow, that you can have the sponsor deliver the first motion on an article. It takes no power away from the FinCom committee. They still will make their advisory recommendation as to vote for or against the article. And people respect the FinCom recommendation and they vote the way they want them to vote. And this only gives us an article to be able to, dis uh, an opportunity to be able to discuss the article rather than have to do a two-step process. Thank you. Is there any other comment at this time? Yes. Ms. Macy Phelps. Uh, Mary Macy Phelps, 295 Clapboard Tree Street. Uh, just by way of full disclosure, I am a former FinCom chair and currently on the library trustees. But I actually have a question which it, for the, um, the petitioner, which is the reasoning, what, if I could understand the reasoning behind changing the bylaw for petition articles but not other articles. Because what, I, I, um, I, I took Ms. LeBlanc's um, point regarding treating some articles differently. If one of the issues is that indefinite postponement is a confusing concept, why are we doing, why are we changing it for some but not all? It seems to me that that, that, that would cause further confusion. I'd be interested in your reasoning. If, uh, if the, the, the chair would entertain and if uh, the petitioner sure, would like to answer it. We, you know, we don't have discussions among each yes. other here. Yes, so. I, I would um, ask Yes, Ms. Conan, moderate. if you would like to respond to that, you may, and then we will move ahead. Articles sponsored by the town boards and committees undergo a completely different um, vetting in public process. We only have the opportunity to go before the FinCom. We're, we can't discuss it out at, except for at town meeting besides FinCom. The other boards get to amend their articles. They continuously hold public hearings. Even recently there was a meeting where after the FinCom had voted on article for the apartments, I believe it was, they continued to hold public hearings for it even after the fact. So it just gives us more of an opportunity to have our voices be heard. Okay, with that, um, Ms. Pervitere, you spoke on this. Ms. Schwartz, and then that will call the question. I'm sorry? I have another person who's speaking. Okay, there's someone here, and then there's someone here. Mom, 
Okay, we only one can speak at a time. So, um, Ms. Schwartz, if you can be brief. Ms. Schwartz. It's my understanding that this article will not allow the FinCom to weigh in on anything at all. That what it will do is just only allow the petitioner to speak. And there does not seem to be in here any, propose, any way of having the FinCom as a group give its input. And I think the FinCom is the group that should be giving the input. They're the people we elected to do that. Okay, thank you. And sir, you and back. Uh, Brendan Mullen, 45 Hawthorne Street, over in Islington. Um, I want to support this motion. I think tonight's meeting was an example of some of the confusion you can have with the indefinite proposal uh, postponement. You have a situation on Article 6 where people were voting where they weren't sure whether they were voting for the article or against the article, and some people I know voted yes for indefinite postponement when they really wanted to vote yes for the, for the article. And it's, it's too confusing for people who don't participate in town meetings and don't participate in all of the town functions on a, re on a regular basis. If someone brings an article to the town, town meeting, it should just be voted on, up or down, debated on. The person who actually brings it to town meeting should have an opportunity to speak on it and then vote yes or no. FinCom can give their opinion, they can study it, they can give their opinion, and we should all get an a, a chance to say yes or no and just go that way. Uh, David Atkins, 85 Parker Street. Um, I would just observe that this article does not change any of the procedure leading up to town meeting. Uh, if there's an article that involves the planning board, it'll still have to go through the planning board process and the planning board will give its recommendation. Um, it'll still go through the FinCom process and they can give their recommendation. The town charter says that the FinCom's purpose is, is to, one of the purposes is to recommend by the method prescribed by the town bylaws the actions to be taken at town meeting. So this article doesn't change anything leading up to town meeting. It simply changes the procedure here at town meeting and it removes the confusing process that acts as a veto essentially on citizen petitions. Um, you have to clear two hoops. You know, you have to get past the indefinite postponement before you can get to talk about the, uh, the substance of the issue. So I, I do support this measure. I don't think it will change the, uh, I don't think it takes away from the power of, uh, or from the recommendation of, of FinCom because you still go through the same process leading up to town meeting. It's just that instead of having to explain to everyone that if you support this, you need to vote against it first, and then, then you can vote for it afterwards. I really think that we could, we could adjust to that process. I think it's a common sense way to vote. I think um, we, the FinCom could simply say, we oppose this, don't vote for it. And then it would come here, and people would vote against it or for it. Instead of having a motion for indefinite postponement, you, the FinCom can explain the reasons behind that recommendation as they do now. Nothing changes leading up to town meeting. It's just the process here by which citizens who offer petition articles have to go through a special process now of, of voting twice. So that's, that's, I support this and I hope we'll pass. Um, we need, Ms. Perbiter, did you want to come to the microphone? Or we're, we're trying to get you on. Chris Prevatero again. Uh, point of order, I, I spoke on the motion for indefinite postponement. You had told me that I had already spoken, but I had not. And now Your speaking point of on order is very well taken. Okay. I, 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 something was raised earlier that why treat the petitioner's articles differently? Well, I've been coming to town meeting since 1982, 1984, and correct me if I'm wrong, but my memory is that the 
FinCom does not usually vote in definite postponement on the selectmen's articles, the planning board's articles, et cetera. So this is why this should be treated differently also, that the, the petitioner, again, as I said before, should be able to speak. Thank you. Seeing and hearing no further discussion, this now comes before town meeting. <coughs> Article 9, <coughs> to vote in favor, um, requires a two-thirds vote because it is a change to a bylaw. So all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. We will again have a standing vote. All of those in favor of Article 9, please stand. So again, you are voting in favor of Article 9. Okay, you may be seated. And those who are opposed to Article 9, please stand.
You may be seated. By a vote of 123 yes and 74 no, the motion does not carry. There is not a two-thirds vote in favor. So Article 9 is defeated. Article 10, to see if the town will vote to approve certain amendments to the Westwood zoning bylaw related to permitting cafeterias, snack bars, gift shops, and vending machines as ex Sorry, there's been a planning board um, report on this, which uh, applies to articles 10 through 12. Um, again, do you need to do it again? Ah, I stand corrected again. Um, Trevor Lobenstein, chair of the planning board, will make the planning board report for articles 10 through 12. Good evening again. Um, my name is Trevor Lobenstein. I'm the chairman of the planning board, resident of 375 Clapper Tree Street. On November 7, 2017, the planning board voted unanimously to recommend a town meeting vote to approve articles 10, 11, and 12 as presented in the warrant. Thank you. Thank you. Article 10, um, to see if the town will vote to approve certain amendments to the Westwood zoning bylaw related to permitting cafeterias, snack bars, gift shops, and vending machines as accessory uses in the highway business zoning district by amending section 4.3.1. Um, this comes before town meeting on the Finance and Warren Commission's unanimous vote to recommend that the town so vote and does require a two-thirds vote. Is there discussion about Article 10? Yes, in back. Paul Kelly, 107 Willard Circle. Um, on this article, uh, highway business through the years for our neighborhood, Willard Circle, we've taken a lot of abuse down there through the years. This is just one thing that keeps coming up, highway business, one change after another. Basically, I'm asking what the definition is to a cafeteria, because we're asking as a neighborhood when some of the buildings were built, that there would be no exhaust from kitchens, blah, blah, blah. So I want to make sure what the definition is of cafeterias. Is it any live cooking inside the buildings to exhaust to the neighborhood? Thank you. Yes. Hi, I'm Abby McCabe, I'm the town planner. Um, we don't have a separate definition in the zoning bylaw for cafeterias, it's as it's listed in the accessory use table that you have in your warrant book um, in front of you. It's intended to serve the employees of the um, organization to be fully within the building. So that can include um, kitchens and snack bars and gift shops. Um, within the building uh, with no outdoor advertising. It's considered an accessory use, which is separate than its own uh, restaurant use. Further discussion about Article 10? Seeing no discussion and reminding folks that this is a two-thirds vote. Mr. Kelly, you do need to be recognized. Is there a microphone? Available. Okay, great. Hi, Paul Kelly, 107 Willard Circle. If there's no definition, how can we vote on this? To the point of, if there's no definition of a cafeteria cooking inside, those buildings when they were built said, uh, I don't know if it's in writing, but there was not going to be any exhaust from food cooking inside the building into the spraying into the neighborhoods. So if there's no definition of ca uh, cafeteria, I don't know how we can vote on this. Please vote no. Any further discussion on Article 10? Again, this requires a two-thirds vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. It is a two-thirds vote in favor of Article 10. 
Article 11, to see if the town will vote to approve certain amendments. Okay, folks, you can't just be yelling out. Is there a problem back there? Okay. <laughs> Someone is back there. Okay. Okay. We don't, I don't see seven people. Are seven people questioning the vote? Okay. So we now have seven people questioning the vote. We will take that vote over again. So back to Article 10. All those in favor, please stand. And again, this is a two-thirds vote. Okay, you can be seated. And all those opposed to Article 10, please stand. If you are standing now, you are opposed to Article 10. You may be seated. By a vote of yes, 101, no, 36, the two-thirds requirement is met and Article 10 passes. Article 11, to see if the town will vote to approve certain amendments to the Westwood Zoning Bylaw related to vari various medical uses. 
Yes, and the point of order is? Do we have a, Paul Kelly, 107 Willard Circle, do we have a quorum? Um, we would, we would need to actually count because not everybody votes, so, um, yeah. so we're going to move along to article 11 to see if the town will vote to approve certain amendments to the Westwood zoning bylaw related to various medical uses by amending section two definitions and section 4.1.2 table of principal uses. This is a, um, requires a two thirds vote and comes before town meeting on the finance and warrant commission's unanimous vote to recommend that the town so vote to approve article 11. Is there a second? All, uh, is there discussion on Article 11? Seeing no discussion, is there, um, is there a question? Hi, Sandra Castellini, 54 Birch Street. It just came to my attention because I feel like a lot of things weren't explained in this table under Article 11, that under substance rehabilitation or treatment facility, there was a change in the ARO um, which would affect an area near where I live. I was wondering if someone could explain why that change is proposed. Is there somebody petitioning for a ch change to, for something that's administrative or research to become a substance rehabilita rehabilitation or treatment facility? Yes. Abby McCabe, I'm the town planner. Um, the planning board proposed this um, amendment, I mean this article, this article does a couple of things. It revises the existing definitions and it adds two new definitions for a hospital and a substance um, rehab or treatment facility. Um, there's no proposals before the planning board. However, when the planning board was reviewing um, for zoning articles, realized these um, these uses were not defined in our bylaw, so um, we've created definitions, and if you have definitions, um, you have to say where they can and cannot locate. Um, so the planning board's proposal is to only allow the um, higher intensity uses, which is the hospital and the rehab facility, um, only by special permit um, in the ARO zoning district. That's what the BA stands for is special permit issued um, by the Zoning Board of Appeals. Yes, over here. We need a microphone. Uh, you need a, a microphone. That one doesn't work. Do we have another working microphone? Please. Morgan Weatherby Drive. I just want to know what ARO is and where that zone is. Yes, Evan. The ARO stands for Administrative Research Office Zone. Um, that is off of High Street. I think we're um, trying to pull up a map right now, but that's the area off of High Street. Um, by Lauderbrook Drive, the area where um, Fox Hill Village and Meditech is currently. Okay. Yes. There's um, one more po um, small um, portion that's of the town that's zoned ARO is um, off of East Street by the highway. Yes, there's a question in back. We need a microphone. A working microphone. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi, Peter Bean, 284 Manhattan Street. 
this question is in relation to the ARO district and the, the closing of the Westwood Lodge. Does this mean that the Westwood Lodge is no longer allowed to operate um, using this district overlay? Are they now out of this district? Ms. Lefner? Westwood Lodge operates as a non-conforming use in a residential zone. It is not part of the ARO district, and this uh, zoning amendment would not make a hospital an allowed use there. That being said, Westwood Lodge property maintains its non-conforming use unless it's abandoned. For it to be abandoned, it would have to be not used for a period of two years or longer. Thank you. Yes. Brian Hardiman, 40 Westdale Road. Um, can we see that map again that had the... So that HB area, if I'm seeing this map correctly, is the Meditech uh, across from the North Fork Country Club? If I could just explain, that map was intended to show where the highway business districts are, but if you look at the two purple blotches, there's one directly at the top of the map. That's at the intersection of High Street and Route 128. That's where the Meditech facility is, um, Fox Hill Village, Clark House, that's that zone. And then the other one happens to be circled within the top HB circle, that other purple spot, and that's where the Meditech facility on East Street is. So those are the two areas that could be considered for a hospital or substance abuse treatment facility if the Zoning Board of Appeals approved a special permit. Right now, those two uses are not mentioned. The procedure for a use not mentioned is also an application to the Zoning Board of Appeals. It would just be an application um, that didn't have special permit criteria. So this gives the defined special permit criteria to an application. Follow up. Can you explain that a little clearer? So you're saying that it's not defined now, but you're defining it so a substance abuse hospital could move into any one of these spots? What I'm saying is right now our zoning bylaw doesn't define hospital. You've probably all heard over the years about towns that fail to define uses like adult uses and by not having a defined term in your bylaw and a place to put that use, someone could say that you didn't take it into consideration and they could go to your zoning board of appeal and file a case that allows for the use to go wherever they want it. So right now, because we don't define hospitals or substance abuse treatment facilities, an applicant could try to make a case before the zoning board to put it anywhere, including in a residential district. By adding the definition and setting a specific zone, and in this case, the planning board's recommended the administrative research office zones, by setting a specific zone, you limit applications to those zones only. The application is still a special permit application, and the Zoning Board of Appeals would hear the merits of the application and determine if it was detrimental to the neighborhood or not. Thank you. Okay. Um, this, again, requires a two-thirds vote and comes before the, before the town meeting on the Finance and Warrant Commission's unanimous vote to, that the town so vote to approve. Article 11, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. no. It is a two-thirds vote in favor of Article 11. Article 12, to see if the town will vote to approve certain housekeeping amendments to various sections of the Westwood zoning bylaw and official zoning map as may be necessary to correct errors on or inconsistencies and clarify sec such sections. This comes before town meeting on the Finance and Warrant Commission's Unanimous vote recommending that the town so vote to approve Article 12 and does require a two-thirds vote. Is there a second? second? Is there discussion about Article 12? Seeing no discussion, all those in favor of Article 12, please signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, no. It is a two-thirds vote in favor of Article 12. Article 13, to see if the town will vote to accept Chapter 41, Section 110A of the Massachusetts General Laws. This requires a majority vote. The Finance and Warrant Commission unanimously recommends that the town so vote. Is there a second? second. Is there discussion on Article 13? 
Seeing no discussion on Article 13, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. It's a unanimous vote in favor of Article 13. Article 14, to see if the town will vote to amend Section 184-10, licensing dogs worrying, maiming, or killing livestock of the town bylaws by adding Section 184-10. This comes before the town on the Finance and Warrant Commission's unanimous recommendation that the town so vote and does require a two-thirds vote. Is there a second? second? Is there discussion on Article 14? Seeing no discussion on Article 14, um, all those, and again requiring a two-thirds vote, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it, and Article 13, 14 passes with a two-thirds majority, two-thirds vote. Article 15, to see if the town will vote to accept as town ways the streets listed below as laid out by the selectmen. Um, Thompson Avenue Westview Estates subdivision as a town way. This requires a two-thirds vote. Comes before town meeting on the Finance and Warrant Commission's unanimous vote recommending that the town so vote. Is there a second? second? Is there discussion on Article 15? Again, requiring a two-thirds vote. All those in favor of uh, approving Article 15 say aye. aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it, two-thirds vote. Article 16, to see if the town will vote to authorize the Board of Selectmen to execute a grant of location and easement across a portion of town land known as Assessor's Map 22, Lot 052 on Clapboard Tree Street for the purpose of a five-foot sidewalk connection from the property at 789 Clapboard Tree Street to the Mercer property in Norwood, which crosses over approximately 50 feet of a town-owned and undeveloped lot. Coming before town meeting on the Finance and Warrant Commission's unanimous vote that recommending that the town so vote and requiring a two-thirds vote, is there a second? Is there discussion on Article 16? Seeing no discussion, and again requiring a two-thirds vote, all those in favor of Article 16, please say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Uh, the ayes have it, and a two-thirds vote in favor of Article 16. Many thanks to you. Happy holidays, and I need a motion to adjourn. Second. We stand adjourned. Thank you, everyone.